Yes, Dr. Prasanna. Uh, hello, all. Welcome to the classroom. And today we'll discuss about uh, airway ultrasound. As you all know, Dr. Neeraj here he is our director of this program. I hope he has got some beautiful videos today. It will be a wonderful class. Dr. Prasanna, please introduce Neeraj and we can start the session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Dr. Neeraj, we know he is the course director for this focus program on the ultrasound. He has already covered a variety of topics in the last four classes. Today is one of the most interesting class and uh, personal favorite to me also. He is going to cover airway ultrasound and the diaphragm function, assessment of the diaphragm function and also the assessment of the gastric volume, which is more important as an anesthesiologist. So, he is ready with all his videos and the presentation. Over to you, Niraj. Welcome to our show again. Okay. Do, do, Dr. Manish, uh, how, how this topic is going to help us today? Can you just uh, uh, tell your opinion on airway ultrasound? Yeah, uh, ultrasound is uh, now it is uh, a clinical tool for, tool for clinicians to see the uh, potency or uh, to assess the difficulty of airway. And it, it, it helps us to manage the airway. Uh, by pre uh, being more predictive than the uh, routine clinical criteria. Then uh, uh, after securing the airway, it is important to uh, confirm the airway devices uh, placement. So it is important in that also. UAG also helps in doing tachostomies and other maneuvers. So that uh, nowadays ultrasound has become the uh, third eye of uh, NSAD. So that it helps in airway management also. Okay, Dr. Neeraj, over to you for this interesting topic today. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today is the four, uh, fourth class uh, of uh, this uh, point of care ultrasound. In the first class, we have learned the basic principles of ultrasound. In the second class, we have covered the uh, application of ultrasound uh, related, to, uh, related to heart that is cardiac ultrasound. In the third class, we have covered the lung ultrasound. And today we are uh, going to cover the most interesting uh, part for, especially for anesthesiologist and uh, intensivist working in ICU, that airway uh, ultrasound. So you must be wondering that um, airway, we, we are uh, uh, managing the airway in a daily practice without ultrasound for so many uh, years. So suddenly uh, we are talking about the ultrasound of airway. And moreover, in the first uh, uh, session, we have uh, seen that air is the enemy of ultrasound. So there is a, uh, two things, uh, there is a contrast that uh, on the one hand, we are talking that air is the enemy of ultrasound. And on the, on the other hand, we are talking uh, a full session of airway ultrasound, how it is possible. Of course, uh, both the things are right. Uh, air is the enemy of ultrasound, that is perfectly all right. Of course, uh, if you see that airway, airway starts from this uh, nose uh, to oropharynx and esopharynx, this, then this trachea, uh, larynx, trachea, and, and uh, uh, bronchi and lungs. So most of the part of airway, uh, there is air column uh, is present, like airway. Uh, so this air, uh, air column uh, present inside the trachea or larynx prevents the ultrasound penetration uh, so that we cannot see the posterior uh, structure. Like we cannot see the posterior wall of trachea, posterior wall of this oropharynx, nasopharynx. That is perfectly all right. But we can see very well the anterior wall of uh, trachea, anterior wall of larynx. And there are so many applications uh, we will uh, see one by one. So uh, starting with the case scenario, uh, uh, you can see that uh, suppose a 40-year-old uh, obese male with a history of uh, road traffic accident uh, comes in the highly crowd, uh, crowded casualty. With the, uh, you can, uh, and you are seeing that uh, the airway is traumatized. Bleeding in the airway um, uh, is, uh, is a finding. And of course, the SPO2 is falling. Uh, and uh, in the emergency setup, the capnography is not available. So in such scenario, uh, the question arises, how would you like to proceed? And is there any role of ultrasound in such scenario? So you can see here that uh, we are receiving a road traffic accident patient who is obese. And, uh, and um, our casualty is uh, very, very much uh, crowded. And airway is traumatized. And SPO2 is falling. 
so uh, moreover capnography is not available so uh, we have to uh, first of all go with the abcd first of all we have to manage the airway because and the uh, since the spo2 is falling we have to do something so uh, in, in the initial phase we uh, if you follow this atls protocol we give oxygen uh, and in spite of giving oxygen the spo2 is not uh, improving then we have to you have to intubate the patient and you can see that uh, uh, in the uh, the general general practice of intubation in such patient in that uh, do a, uh, either uh, direct laryngoscopy or video laryngoscopy or fiber optic and intubate uh, the patient but you can see that there is airway is traumatized you cannot uh, uh, mouth opening is very very much limited and moreover uh, the, there is bleeding in the airway and so what will you do of course uh, you have to um, so, so fiber optics not a option for intubate in such patient and uh, after uh, the at the air, you can see then that, that this is a difficult uh, airway scenario so you have to intubate uh, either with the direct laryngoscopy or video laryngoscopy so after intubation you want to confirm that whether the might uh, tube is inside the trachea or esophagus because airway is difficult so uh, uh, there is a high probability that you cannot see the this uh, um, the the vocal cords and you have to assume that i am uh, going um, just uh, uh, my tube is going inside the trachea but you have to confirm that whether the my tube is inside the trachea or uh, esophagus so uh, generally we confirm with cap capnography but capnography is not available in the casualty so you have to depend upon this auscultatory findings so aus on auscultation is also um, uh, not so much uh, reliable in especially in um, uh, in, in uh, crowded places because uh, there is so much noise in the casualty so fiber optic is also not an option here so after intubation you have to confirm so uh, how do you confirm so uh, confirmation is very very important I, as you have seen that acls also suggests that after putting a tube inside the trachea you have to confirm whether it is in the trachea or esophagus so all the options are not uh, good here so you have ultrasound you just have to uh, uh, take a probe and put it here and you can directly see whether my tube is going inside the trachea or inside the esophagus and you need not to ventilate the patient in such scenario there is also a very um, uh, very uh, crucial that you if you if there is uh, you are you, if you are not sure about the npo status if you ventilate the, that patient so a stomach content might go inside the uh, uh, lung so in such scenario if there is a instrument available which can which can confirm you that the tube is inside the esophagus or trachea even without ventilation that is a, a very good thing so you can see uh, this is one scenario you are seeing that uh, application of uh, this uh, ultrasound moreover if 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 your tube is inside the esophagus suppose you have intubated the patient and your tube is inside the esophagus then you have to you have to take out the tube and re repeat uh, the intubation process so in such scenario also suppose your intubation has failed you can see that uh, this is the difficulty airway algorithm suppose your plan a is failed then so the plan b is putting a lma so lma uh, suppose your lma is also failed then you have to plan uh, uh, you have to go to plan c and ultimately you have you are land up in uh, doing uh, uh, this uh, can't intubate can't uh, ventilate scenario so you if this cricothyrotomy is the last resort of uh, airway management so here also if the you you have seen that your patient is obese you they, there's a difficult airway the spo2 is falling your plan a plan b all the all the uh, plan are failed and you have reached this situation now this cricothyrotomy is also not uh, very easy to uh, do in such situation because uh, as you have seen that uh, patient is obese and there is a difficult airway so if you have uh, mark the this cricothyroid membrane before in, uh, making an intubation attempt then the the site of puncture was already established then it is easy to do cricothyroidotomy in such situation so uh, you can see that there are several application of ultrasound while managing the airway we will see one by one
So objective of uh, the talk uh, of uh, today's uh, class is the first of all, we will see. So sono anatomy of airway, how the airway looks in the ultrasound picture. Then we will see the several applications of ultrasound. We will be surprised to know um, uh, as, you, we, as we progress that there are so many applications like i have uh, made the thing simple uh, and divide into pre intubation phase that in, that is pre operative phase then uh, intubation phase that intraoperative and after extubation and uh, sometimes in the icu also you want to uh, make sure that uh, uh, the weaning should be successful that is also uh, a very good application of ultrasound that is uh, we will see one by one you can see that before intubation suppose patient is posted for any surgery what do uh, the first step we do the pre anesthetic checkup in the pre anesthetic checkup we uh, the on the most uh, the crucial party we want to assess uh, the uh, the, uh, the airway examination, whether the airway, our airway is uh, the simple uh, airway to manage or difficult airway. So prediction of uh, difficult airway is also sometimes uh, difficult. We'll see one by one. So and after that, uh, in if you uh, if you say that uh, we uh, the what is the tube size of uh, adult male that is very simple, eight to eight point five tube size for. This uh, adult female is also 7 to 7.5. But for uh, pediatric age group, sometimes it is difficult. Uh, and we have to depend upon this age related formula that is age divided by uh, 4 plus 4.5. So even up after applying this formula, sometimes it is difficult uh, to predict the, the exact size of the endotracheal tube we are going to insert in pediatric age group. So we can take a help of ultrasound here also. And sometimes if there is a anticipated uh, uh, anticipated difficulty airway, suppose malam party uh, grade 4, then uh, you have to think about uh, awake fiber optic intubation. So uh, we have to do uh, several kinds of preparation for awake uh, fiber optic intubation. And the most important is you have to block the superior laryngeal and trans uh, laryngeal not block and for blocking this uh, superior laryngeal nerve we have we generally palpate this hyoid bone then thyroid bone and we uh, put a needle uh, to uh, block this nerve but we are not sure whether we are targeting the uh, superior laryngeal nerve uh, uh, the accuracy is uh, uh, there is a confusion about the accuracy but we we will surprise to know that uh, uh, we can uh, with the help of ultrasound, uh, superior laryngeal can be blocked uh, with a more confident manner. And also, sometimes in the pre-operative uh, stage, uh, there is a uh, we generally uh, keep the patient NPO for six to eight hours. But if there is an emergency case or semi-emergent case, the NPO status is uh, um, not you are not sure about the NPO status. Then there is a problem. So we can directly visual, visualize the gastric uh, part of uh, uh, enteral part of uh, this uh, stomach with the help of ultrasound and we can directly see whether the uh, stomach is empty or this is full st uh, stomach. So ultrasound also very, um, very fascinating role uh, for assessing uh, the, the, the risk of aspiration before, uh, before intubating the patient. Now talk about this uh, intraoperative that is uh, intubation phase. So many times uh, uh, we want to confirm that our tube is inside the trachea or esophagus or endobronchial. So this is also very important. We will see uh, one by one in the uh, coming slides. And after um, uh, the procedure is over, you want to extubate the patient. Uh, or in the ICU setup also, we, uh, we do uh, extubation. But sometimes you must have seen that our extubation has failed. Uh, after extubation, we have to re-intubate the patient. So prediction of successful intubation is very, very challenging for, uh, um, for anesthesiologists or uh, intensivists. So there is a way that uh, we can predict uh, the post excavation of strider with the help of ultrasound. That is very, very, uh, and if there is a probability, we will postpone our excavation. 
then uh, of course the vocal cord uh, function uh, uh, we, we can directly see the both the vocal cords and we can diagnose whether there is a vocal cord uh, pulse or not and uh, uh, about cricothyroidotomy we ha i have already told that this is the last resort of uh, this uh, airway uh, uh, management and uh, and uh, ultrasound uh, we we can uh, point out uh, we can clearly define the cricothyroid membrane and we uh, that is very important uh, with the help of ultrasound and, and the success rate increases regarding pct this uh, is a uh, very important procedure generally uh, done in uh, our iso setup when the patient is a prolonged ventilation so generally it can be done by this landmark method or fiber optic method uh, so ultrasound is also very uh, very emerging in this field also we will see how it is uh, done with the help of others so first of all uh, uh, talk about the basic appearance of uh, this airway structure uh, with the help of uh, ultrasound so generally air, uh, the airway means this larynx, larynx and this trachea is the main component of our uh, our uh, this uh, airway so you know this uh, larynx is made up of uh, cartilages there are three pair of cartilages and this is three unpaired of cartilage the thyroid cartilage and cricoid cartilage and epiglottis is more so most important here so there are cartilages there are thyroid glands and uh, of course there is uh, this airway column Uh, so we we want to know how this uh, structure looks like in the ultrasound so first of all uh, there is a hyoid bone also so you know we, this general part we have already covered that's bone appears hypoechoic with hypoechoic side so there is one important bone that is hyoid bone situated in the airway so uh, uh, so bone is hypoechoic in appearance and cartilage about cartilage uh, cartilage is generally homogeneously hypo hypoechoic bone is hyperechoic cartilage is hypoechoic and uh, there are certain uh, sort muscles uh, muscles appear hypoechoic with heterogeneous appearance cartilage is homogeneous but muscles are heterogeneous uh, straight in appearance and the glands glands mainly thyroid glands are there uh, you can see this is a gland and this is a muscle so uh, the gland is uh, homogeneously and mild to uh, strongly hyperechoic this is homogeneous mild to st uh, strong hyperechoic appearance and this am uh, this is the, the this is trachea and you can see this this is the anterior part of the trachea this is posterior part and this is filled up with the air column so because of air column we cannot see the posterior part but we can very well uh, see the anterior part of uh, this trachea so there is a junction between this this uh, mucosa of the anterior uh, trachea and there is a intraluminal layer so this is called a air mucosal interface so this this gives a white hyperechoic line so am interface gives the bright hyperechoic line and inside there is a air column so air column there are we cannot see any true structure so we what we are seeing these artifacts so there are comatal or reverberation artifacts they, they are the general appearance then I start from the up uh, to the down side so first of all uh, uh, just i want to say that as airway is a superficial structure okay so generally in the first class we have seen that there are three kinds of probe one is linear probe then curvilinear probe then cardiac probe of course uh, since the airway is a superficial structure so we are using linear probe or oh, the air linear probe is very very good for seeing this airway structure a very good resolution only one thing when we want to see this uh, tongue so when we want to visualize this tongue we we have to use this curvilinear probe so for starting from the upper side so first of all when we want to visualize this tongue we have we are using this curvilinear probe in a sagittal section and we will obtain this picture so you can see that this is the mantum of mand mantum of mand mandible and this there is the hyoid bone so in the two corner there are two bones so this is the mantum and this is the hyoid so this 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 these things are uh, bony structure so they are hyperechoic with hypoechoic side hyperechoic with hypoechoic side and these are the uh, these are the neck uh, muscles and the bulk of the, this structure is uh, this uh, tongue okay and this is the, the the junction between the tongue and the palatal surface so outer border of the tongue is hyperechoic 
and uh, the majority of the this uh, 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 muscular part of the tongue appear hypoechoic so you can say uh, whenever you want to visualize this tongue uh, you have to use this curvilinear probe and this is the position now come, uh, come little lower side so after the this uh, mentum you have to uh, you can see there is a hyoid bone hyoid bone you know uh, very well that hyoid bone is uh, uh, is very important when whenever we want to uh, block the superior laryngeal now generally we palpate this uh, bone with and we hit this needle and slightly uh, below we inject our local anesthetic while blocking this superior laryngeal now so you know this hyoid is a bone so it will appear as a hyperechoic with hypoechoic side okay so this is a inverted u shaped structure with posterior acoustic side this is the super always remember this is this will be the superior uh, this is the superficial part this is the deeper part the superficial part is generally skin and this is the deeper part uh, if you are working in the transverse axis this this will be the right side and this will be the left side and if you are working in a longitudinal direction then it will be the cephalic side and this will be the caudal side this is the general uh, general concept now come to the a little bit lower side and after the hyoid bone there is a there is a thyroid cartilage and there is a one very very important structure like between the hyoid and the thyroid that is thyrohyoid membrane okay so the, uh, the this is the hyoid this is the uh, this is the thyroid cartilage so in between there is the thyrohyoid membrane so you know uh, uh so through this window we can visualize epiglottis sometimes we need to know uh, the uh, the about the epiglottis so uh, this is the superficial part this is the deeper part this is right and left in the transverse axis so the, the epiglottis is a cartilage so it is a very thin hypoechoic in appearance and just anterior to this epiglottis there is a pre epiglottis space and that is filled with the fibro fatty tissue so that's why it is a hyperechoic in appearance huh? these are the strap muscles and just behind the epiglottis and uh, there is the air mucosal interface you, you you must be thinking why, why we want to see this epiglottis sometimes we this uh, the measurement from this skin to the epiglottis gives a clue about the difficult laryngoscopy and uh, ENT people are also uh, interested to know about the epiglottis whenever they are suspecting some epiglottis related pathology like epiglottitis. So uh, we are just moving uh, uh, further uh, thyroid to uh, current. So before moving further, just see this very important view. Uh, we, uh, we will see the airway in a transverse axis and in a longitudinal axis. So this video is um, is a foundation uh, knowledge so, uh, to progress further so i uh, so we, we we will see the uh, first video that is a transverse view of the airway this is transverse view of the airway with the help of ultrasound we have taken a linear probe with a probe marker towards the right side of the patient first of all we are at the thyroid cartilage level Thyroid cartilage appears as inverted v shaped appearance with the vocal cord inside. After that, we will move our probe towards the downward direction to reach at cricoid cartilage level. And you can see that there is hypoechoic inverted arch like appearance of the cricoid cartilage. After that, we will move our probe. After that, we will move our probe in a downward direction to reach at the suprasternal midline level. And first of all, we can see the trachea in the male line and we have to identify the thyroid gland anterolateral to the trachea. 
This IPS has a homogeneous hyperechoic appearance. After that, we will move our probe in a lateral direction towards the patient's left side to identify esophagus. An esophagus is situated posterolateral to the trachea, just below the left lobe of the thyroid gland, and it is multilayered collapse structure. Uh, so you have uh, seen this uh, transverse view of airway. Now we are uh, going to see the longitudinal view of the airway. In the second, this video is very important for the. These are the basic concepts. This is longitudinal view of the airway with the pro marker placed on cephalic side. First of all, we have to identify the right hyperechoic line that is air mucosal interface, and above that, a series of round hypoechoic structures. That is a string of bead appearance. So you have seen this uh, uh, transverse view and the longitudinal view of the airway. So, uh, uh, so after the identification of this hyoid, uh, we are coming uh, at the level of thyroid cartilage. So you you know you have seen in the video that uh, this is the thyroid cartilage. So th th since this is a cartilage, so it will appear as a hypoechoic, and you can see that this is uh, inverted V-shaped structure. So we have to place this curve in uh, this linear probe over the thyroid cartilage, and the probe marker was the right side of the patient. So uh, this is the thyroid cartilage. And inside the thyroid cartilage, you can see the vocal cords. So vocal cords uh, are very important uh, while assessing the vocal cord uh, movement. So, so you know that uh, there are two kinds of vocal cords: uh, true vocal cords and false vocal cords. So false vocal cord is situated like uh, a little bit sifflet side uh, of the true vocal cord. True vocal cord situated in the lower side, and uh, true vocal cords is hypoechoic in appearance but its medial border is hyperechoic because of this vocal ligament so uh, sometimes if you are finding uh, difficult to see this uh, vocal uh, cord you have to make uh, you have to say that uh, the patient should make some voice like a or e so that this vocal cord become uh, prominent as you have seen uh, in the video so we, we have a video for that this is the third video to show the vocal cord uh, movement after phonation. This is transverse view of the airway at the level of thyroid cartilage. Inside the thyroid cartilage, we can see true and false vocal cords and the movement of the vocal cords becomes prominent on phonation that means asking the patient to make some voice so uh, th th that is uh, the thyroid cartilage level and after that uh, there is a cricoid cartilage that is circular cricoid cartilage but there is one very important uh, structure that between the two cartilage that is cricothyroid membrane and that is a very important to identify whenever you are uh, anticipating any difficult airway it's better idea to make a mark over this cricothyroid uh, membrane so that if emergency arises you need not to waste uh, your time uh, finding this membrane. So sometimes uh, this membrane is very difficult to identify in uh, in uh, in an obese patient or distorted anatomy. So you just have to keep this probe uh, over here, and you can see this is the thyroid cartilage and this is the cricoid cartilage, and and uh, and you can very well visualize this uh, cricothyroid membrane. This is a hyper hyper echoic band between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage and this bright hyperechoic line is the air mucosal interface so this is the structure of interest now uh, identification of cricothyroid membrane uh, is uh, also very important we have a video for that this is longitudinal view of the airway 
Here we are keeping the lower edge of the linear probe at the suprastern notch level with the probe marker towards the cephalic side. And first of all, we can identify the bright hyperechoic line that is here mucosal interface, and above that, a string of bead appearance of the required ventricular cartilages. After that, move your probe little bit in a cephalic direction so that we can also see thyroid cartilage. And now we can identify the cricothyroid membrane between the thyroid and cricoid cartilage. So after this uh, cricothyroid membrane, just we want to see uh, the cricoid. So this is a very uh, beautiful picture of the cricoid. So cricoid is, of course, this is a ligament. So this will be a hypoechoic uh, structure. So this is a transverse, in the transverse view, it appears as uh, inverted arch-like appearance, and this is uh, air mucosal interface. So this this was the thyroid cartilage, and you have to move your probe a little bit in the lower side to reach at the cricoid uh, cartilage level. And in the longitudinal view, it, it appears as a rounded hump or bump-like structure. And you, uh, this is, uh, after the, uh, this cricoid cartilage, uh, we want to visualize this tracheal uh, part. So this is longitudinal view of the trachea. You can see that uh, we have keep uh, our linear probe over the uh, trachea. And remember, uh, this, this is the lower edge of the probe. We have to keep at the uh, this uh, suprasternal notch. And you have to keep in the midline. Okay, this is very, very important. Then only we'll receive this picture, beautiful picture. So this is the um, uh, cranial side. This is the caudal side. This is the superficial and this is the deep. So you will see this string of bead appearance. First of all, you have to identify this bright hyperechoic line that is the air mucosal interface. And you will see this, uh, 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 this several rounded structure. This is number one. Uh, this is number one tracheal cartilage, number two tracheal cartilage, and so on. And most prominent uh, rounded structure is cricoid cartilage. So uh, this is this is very important uh, structure. Where, so this is the site for uh, cricothyroidotomy, and this is the T1 and T2 is the site for percutaneous tracheostomy. So so, so this uh, picture is very very useful. So after that. Uh, 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 keep the probe in a transverse position at the supra uh, sternal level okay this is uh, the, at this level you will receive this picture so first of all you have to identify that this is the trachea okay this is the tracheal in, uh, am interface and this is the reverberation artifacts inside the trachea then uh, at this uh, position you, you can see that there is a thyroid gland Okay, this is the one. Uh, this is the right uh, left lobe. This is the right lobe of thyroid gland, and this is the isthmus of the thyroid gland. And you can see that this is the tracheal cartilage. So tracheal cartilage is also a hypoechoic in appearance. So, uh, so this uh, after that you have to move. Uh, so appearance of thyroid gland I have already discussed. This is homogeneously hyperechoic with finally a speckled appearance. So after that we will move our probe a little bit lateral side to identify the esophagus. So in the next slide you are seeing that I have just moved my probe towards the left side of the patient in the same suprasternal position. So this is the position you you can see this thyroid gland is suprolateral to the trachea while the esophagus is infrolateral to the trachea and it is also situated just below the left lobe of the thyroid gland and generally it is a multi-layered and mixed ecogenicity and a collapse structure but if you want to make it prominent ask the person to uh, the to swallow and just lateral, this is the carotid artery and internal jugular vein. So esophagus is very, very important in a structure. Uh, and there is a video for that, uh, how to make the esophagus more prominent. This is suprasternal lateral view to identify esophagus. To make the esophagus more prominent, ask the person to swallow. This is transverse view 
at the level of suprasternal notch, a little bit lateral side, first of all we can identify the left lobe of thyroid gland and just below that uh, esophagus is situated and esophagus becomes more prominent on the act of swallowing because of uh, peristalsis. Uh, seen that uh, uh, the sono anatomy part, we will see uh, one by one what is the application of this uh, um, airway ultrasound. So, uh, before uh, intubation and during intubation and after extubation. So, before intubation, there are several applications. Now, the most important is we want to predict whether they, uh, our airway is difficult or not. We, is there any difficult uh, airway or difficult laryngoscopy? We can predict. So first of all, uh, uh, this is a special type of ultrasound that is sublingual ultrasound. There is a micro convex probe and uh, this uh, who at all have um, had, uh, has found that uh, whenever you uh, put this uh, this uh, micro convex probe in the in a, in a, in a sublingual part, you can uh, see uh, this is the uh, if there is uh, difficulty in uh, visualizing this hyoid bone, hyoid bone is situated in the deeper side. If the hyoid bone is visible, then it is this is a simple laryngoscopy. If it is not uh, visible uh, with this uh, sublingual ultrasound, that, that will be a difficult uh, laryngoscopy. After that, there are several measurements uh, from the soft tissue thickness at the various neck level. And if the, uh, uh, the thickness is more, that is indicating towards the uh, difficult laryngoscopy. And if the thickness is less, that is indicating uh, 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 easy laryngoscopy. So you can see that uh, measurement can be done at the level of uh, this hyoid bone. Measurement can be done uh, at the level of this uh, epiglottis, or you can also measure the uh, this tongue thickness. So there are several uh, measurements by which we can anticipate whether there is a difficult layer way or so there are several uh, studies you will find but but most of the studies are pilot studies uh, with a small sample size so that we have to keep in mind so uh, 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 there are several uh, uh, several ultrasound parameters by which we can predict uh, about the difficult laryngoscopy so this is very uh, uh, important uh, study that is by adhikari at all by uh, published in academic emergency medicine and they, they have shown that uh, if in the case uh, from the skin to hyoid level thickness they have measured and they have shown that if the measurement is uh, about 1.7 centimeter that indicating difficult laryngoscopy if the measure in the in the case of eg laryngoscopy the measurement was uh, 1.3 centimeter while at the thyroid hyoid membrane uh, this is the thyroid hyoid membrane uh, to see the from the skin to epiglottis uh, uh, thickness. In the difficult laryngoscopy, they have uh, seen that the uh, distance was 3.5 and the EG 2.5 centimeters. So threshold was 2. Point, uh, this uh, if the they have uh, they have calculated a cutoff value that is 2.8 uh, centimeters. If it is more than that, that will be treated as a difficult laryngoscopy. If it is less than that. Uh, there will be a EG laryngoscope. After that, uh, uh, predicting the tube size is very easy in uh, in case of uh, adult patient, but in case of pediatric patient, uh, the, the estimation of tube size is uh, sometimes um, uh, sometimes uh, there is a problem. So ultrasound have a role here. We will see uh, estimation of endotracheal tube. Uh, and many times we have to change this tracheostomy tube. Uh, so uh, after uh, that is also one of the uh, problem that uh, um, uh, sometimes uh, there might be a tracheal stenosis. In that case, estimation of tube size is very very difficult. So uh, you just have to measure this tracheal diameter, and uh, we can very accurately say that uh, this number of tube is ideal for this patient. And uh, uh, and you must have realized during uh, this. Uh, uh, one lung ventilation, we have to insert this double lumen tube, and sometimes there is a confusion. What what uh, what is the exact site uh, of the DLT? Uh, so th there is also uh, a role of ultrasound here to estimate the size of the DLT. So first of all, we will see this endotracheal tube size in the pediatric age group. So you just have to measure this uh, the the tracheal diameter. This is a transverse diameter at the level of subglottis, and that is very well accurately correspond to this uh, transverse diameter 
uh, of the outer diameter of the uh, endotracheal tube. That is the catch here. You have this transverse diameter correspond to the outer diameter of the endotracheal tube, not the inner diameter. That you have to remember. So, and uh, Kim et al. Uh, in the academy, uh, actor and physiologist candidly have shown that measurement with the help of ultrasound is superior uh, compared to this age or height based uh, formulas. And you can see the, uh, here that uh, uh, regarding uh, uh, double lumen tube, there uh, sometimes there is a confusion. So, uh, Sustik et al. have shown in the publishing the Journal of Clinical Anesthesia has shown that uh, by measuring this tracheal diameter, we can very well estimate the size of the uh, left size of a double lumen tube. You can see uh, that uh, uh, sometimes uh, in the emergency, especially in emergency cases, we are in a dilemma that we uh, our tube has gone inside the trachea or esophagus. And sometimes in the pediatric age group, there is high tendency, tendency of the endotracheal to go inside the right bronchus, that is endobronchial uh, uh, intubation. So there are several uh, uh, techniques by which we can see that uh, 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 we can confirm that uh, there, there is an uh, endotracheal intubation. Uh, the most important uh, is uh, visualizing the passage of endotracheal to, uh, through the vocal cords. That is one method. And after the intubation, and uh, auscultation is a very important method. And after that, uh, uh, we uh, we take the help of capnography. Capnography is sub supposed to be gold standard. But you must have seen that in the emergency setup, in the ICU setup, capnography is not available. So you have to uh, develop. Uh, you uh, we have uh, the very uh, very useful uh, instrument that is ultrasound. We can confirm uh, the 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 exact position of the tube. And that the beauty is that you can confirm this uh, uh, this position of the endotracheal tube even before ventilation. So you, you uh, if the patient is not full stomach, you there are chances of aspiration is uh, reduced here. So we will see uh, how it is done. This is very interesting. So you can see that there are several ad advantages of that. Moreover, you uh, you must have seen that in cardiac arrest patient. The cap uh, capnography is not reliable because of the uh, lower uh, pulmonary uh, blood flow. And th with the help of ultrasound, the one method is direct method. You can visualize directly whether my tube is going inside the trachea or inside the esophagus. But there are uh, also indirect method, like with the help of sliding sign and with the help of diaphragm movement, we can uh, see that um, uh, the, we can see we confirm the the exact position of the endotracheal tube. So there is a very important paper that is uh, tracheal rapid ultrasound uh, by Chao et al. published in resuscitation. They have shown that uh, with the direct method of ultrasound uh, as a confirmatory of the endotracheal uh, tube, the sensitivity uh, was 98% and specificity was 94%. So with the help of ultrasound, we can confirm the, the exact position of the endotracheal tube. So you can see, um, this, this is very interesting, how we, uh, the endotracheal tube uh, confirm that the tube is inside the trachea or esophagus. You know, uh, is identification of the esophagus we have already seen. This is a collapse structure. So uh, we, I'm talking about the direct method of the confirmation. You just have to keep your uh, linear probe over this area and try to visualize the, uh, the uh, esophagus part. and if your endotracheal tube is not going to the esophagus, then it is a confirmatory sign that it is going into the trachea. If the endotracheal tube is going inside the esophagus, the esophagus becomes dilated. You can see if the tube is inside the esophagus, it is dilated and there's a mini trachea, a small trachea formation. So immediately, if you're seeing this phenomenon, you, you can just confirm that the tube is inside the esophagus, not in the, inside the trachea. And the, the, the beauty is you have confirmed this uh, uh, esophageal positioning of the endotracheal tube without any ventilation. So if, if you uh, confirm that my tube is inside the esophagus, you just have to withdraw 
uh, the tube and make a new attempt of endotracheal intubation. Now, this, uh, this, uh, there are uh, two indirect methods also. This is the one method that is lung sliding sign. And the, and the second uh, indirect method is diaphragm movement. First of all, you have in the lung ultrasound, we have already seen what is sliding sign. So sliding sign is the movement of the pleura with the ventilation. So if the, there is no movement, the pleura will be static. So suppose your tube is inside the esophagus then the, there will be no sliding sign okay so if uh, uh, the sliding sign is absent in the both both the left side and right side the tube is inside the esophagus that is confirmed but if the sliding sign is absent on the left side and it is present on the right side. That means your tube is inside the right bronchus. That is endobronchial intubation. So that is that is the beauty of this lung. Moreover, you know that capnography, although it, it is a gold standard for endotracheal confirmation, but it cannot distinguish the endobronchial intubation. And with the help of lung sliding, you can do that. You can do that. Uh, you can confirm that this is the endobronchial intubation. And another very interesting uh, um, uh, way of determination is diaphragm movement. So diaphragm movement we have also also seen in the lung ultrasound. You just have to keep your probe over this uh, mid axillary line, and you ca you can see that di the beautiful diaphragm. And this is the uh, this is the abdomen. This is the thorax. With if your tube is inside the trachea, and with the ventilation, your and this diaphragm will move downward. And if it is ins inside the esophagus, there either there will be no movement of the diaphragm or there will be a paradoxical movement. Okay, paradoxical movement is because uh, if your tube is inside the esophagus, uh, because of ventilation, there will be inflation of the stomach and the intra-abdominal pressure. And because of that, if you are ventilating the diaphragm, instead of going down it will go up that is the paradoxical one so if you are uh, seeing this paradoxical movement of the diaphragm your tube is not inside the trachea so that is one thing and moreover if the diaphragm movement is perfect that is downward direction in the right side but it if it is not in the left side that is the diagnosis of endobronchial intubation these are the things so I have made a very simple chart. So uh, sometimes it, uh, you might uh, uh, you might think that is uh, confusing, but to make the thing very simple. Suppose this is the endotracheal tube in the in, in the, inside the trachea and the inside the esophagus and inside the right bronchus. So be, with the help of this direct method, there will be if the tube is inside the trachea, there will be no mini trachea formation. Esophagus will not be dilated. But if your tube inside the esophagus, the esophagus becomes dilated and there will be mini trachea formation. Similarly, if the tube in the right bronchus, so here also there will be no mini trachea formation. Suppose uh, talk about lung sliding. In the endotracheal, there will be bilateral sliding sign positive. In the esophagus, the sliding sign will be absent. Moreover, you may find the lung pulse. So lung pulse, I have already described, this is the pulsation uh, felt at the pleura because of heart contraction. So if the pleura is a static, you, uh, and if the sliding sign is absent, you may get this lung pulse. Moreover, for right bronchus, right, uh, right sided lung sliding is positive, left sided lung uh, sliding will be absent. Talk about diaphragm movement. If the endotracheal tube is inside the trachea, there will be bilateral normal diaphragm movement. If if it is esophagus, there will be no more normal movement. Instead, you may get paradoxical movement. But if your tube is inside the right bronchus, there will be diaphragm movement normal on the right side and abnormal on the left side. Now Coming to cricothyrotomy, we have already seen that in the can't intubate, can't uh, ventilate uh, situation. Ultimately, you have to do this uh, cricothyrotomy. But uh, 
sometimes it is very uh, difficult to perform whenever uh, there is a difficult airway situation suppose patient is obese there is distorted anatomy there is short neck the identification of the cricothyroid from is very very difficult in those scenarios so with the help of ultrasound you you obtain this picture and make a mark of that i am repeatedly saying that if you are anticipating that there is a difficult airway you may land up in a can't into wet can't situation uh, can't ventilate situation it's better idea to make the cricothyroid make a mark over the cricothyroid membrane so that you don't have to waste your time precious time while doing this cricothyroidotomy in case in case emergency arises so it's always better uh, uh, to mark this but identification of the this um, uh, cricothyroidotomy with the lad traditional landmark method is sometimes very very difficult especially in the difficult anatomy so uh, you you see that this is thyroid cartilage this is cricoid cartilage this is cricothyroid membrane so uh, so what uh, what is the technique uh, the technique uh, uh, is um, that is very uh, sop technique that the string of pearl technique is described so first of all you had to identify this string of pearl appearance and after that move your probe little bit upward direction so that you can identify this cricothyroid membrane and uh take a metallic uh, needle uh, like thing uh, and put this needle uh, in between this probe surface and the skin surface and you will get a shadow of this uh, over this membrane and after after uh, after that remove this probe and make a mark over this cricothyroid membrane so in a difficult uh, airway uh, scenario when you are anticipating it's better to mark this area and then proceed for the uh, the sedation or intubation attempt this is very very useful so we have a video uh, how it is done this clip is showing ultrasound guided cricothyroidotomy we are following sop techniques means we have to identify a string of pearl appearance in a longitudinal view after that we will move the probe cephalic direction to identify cricothyroid membrane between the thyroid and cricoid cartilage now with one hand we are holding the probe and with the other hand we are inserting a metallic object between the probe and the skin surface and we can see that this metallic object creating a shadow over the cricothyroid membrane between the thyroid and cricoid cartilage now we are removing this transducer and this metallic object is now corresponding to cricothyroid membrane and we can mark this area with the permanent marker and this point correspond to cricothyroid membrane for our future reference in case cricothyroid tomy is needed now we are moving towards the percutaneous tracheostomy uh, this is a frequently done procedure in the icu Uh, whenever uh, you are uh, anticip anticipating that uh, there is a, there will be a prolonged ventilation so there uh, th there is a landmark method or with the help of fiber optic so you, you must have seen that uh, with the fiber optic the uh, the the procedure becomes very very um, very very easy but for sometimes fiber optic is uh, not uh, available but uh, there is one disadvantage with the fiber optic guided percutaneous uh, tracheostomy it compromises the ventilation okay uh, during the um, uh, during the uh, whenever you want to insert uh, this uh, fiber optic you have to disconnect uh, the ventilation and there are chances of hypercarbia that is very dangerous in the head injury patient uh, this hypercarbia may increase the icp so ultrasound also very uh, very um, useful technique emerging in this uh, field 
So moreover, there are other advantages of uh, of the ultrasound also. Uh, like you can see that before making an incision over the, uh, this area, uh, you can just see whether any blood vessel is present or or not. Uh, so you know that uh, one of the complication of PCT is uh, bleeding. So when uh, whenever you are seeing that okay, the, there is a blood uh, vessel is present um, over the area, you will try to avoid incision over that uh, area. So uh, this is the, uh, uh, the diagramic uh, representation. Uh, there are several adva advantages of ultrasound. You uh, sometimes it, it is difficult to uh, choose uh, which is the ideal uh, intercostal spaces. So ultrasound also have a, a very important role. You can very well uh, see that what is uh, the ideal uh, this uh, tracheal interspace. After that, whenever you are uh, putting the needle, sometimes it is difficult to uh, to uh, confirm so you can uh, track this uh, needle uh, path also with the help of ultrasound this is the needle after that whenever you are uh, inserting the guide wire that in uh, that is also uh, very well uh, can be uh, seen with the help of ultrasound so there are several uh, application of ultrasound uh, during the pct procedure you can see the you can see the ideal interspace you can very well uh, see the blood vessel you can see your needle and you can see the, your guide guide wire also and uh, uh, one of the important application uh, of ultrasound uh, is that whenever uh, you are you must have seen in your day-to-day uh, -day practice that when after the intubation extubation sometimes patient develop post extubation strider and we have to reintubate the uh, patient so what is post extubation strider so this is uh, sometimes uh, uh, whenever this um, occurs mainly whenever uh, you are continuously ventilating the patient uh, more than 24 hour that is because of this laryngeal uh, edema mainly uh, so uh, Ultrasound, uh, you you must have uh, heard about the couplic uh, test also. There is, this is also one of the uh, method, but uh, that that method is not uh, reliable. So you can see that with the help of ultrasound, you just have to uh, keep your probe at the this uh, vocal cord level, and you can see this is the in uh, tube inflated. So before uh, before deflation, you in the inflated uh, cup position you can see this is the uh, this is air column width of the uh, of the uh, this is air column width with the help of ultrasound and after deflation when your cuff is deflated you can see that this air column width is increased so if the air column width is increased their chances of post extubation shadow is less but even after deflation of the cuff, the air column width is not increasing, but it the size remains same. That indicates the vocal cord edema, and you can anticipate the post extubation strider. Okay, uh, uh, and uh, there is a very uh, landmark uh, study by Deng et al. published in the European Journal of uh, Respiratory Journal. They have shown that in non-strider uh, group of patient. The air column width was 6.4, uh, while in the strider it was less, 4.5 uh, millimeter. The the air column width difference before inflation and deflation, the in the non-strider group it was 1.5 millimeter, and it was less in a strider group. So the the message is, uh, if if after deflation if the air column the uh, difference increases that's an indication of uh, uh, not occurrence of post extubation if the difference remains narrow or difference is not then there is indication of post extubation as tried now uh, uh, this is a very interesting application of ultrasound you must have realized uh, during fiber uh, this fiber awake fiber of optic intubation you have to block this uh, this trans uh, laryngeal and the superior laryngeal now to make this uh, mucosal surface uh, anesthetize so this is the uh, superior laryngeal now this uh, this uh, this is internal branch this is external branch so, so 
we generally block this nerve after palpating this hyoid bone and uh, we generally inject 2 to 3 ml um, to this area but uh, sometimes uh, this is not so much reliable and uh, you just have to keep the either linear or this uh, hockey stick probe and you will see this is the uh, cephalic side and this is the caudal side so this is the hyoid bone and this is the uh, thyroid cartilage and between the hyoid and the thyroid, there is a thyrohyoid membrane and thyrohyoid muscle. And the superior laryngeal nerve is just situated just uh, close to this thyroid hyoid membrane. So uh, uh, it's better to use a hockey stick uh, probe here. But if you don't have this hockey stick uh, probe, uh, then you can also use this uh, linear probe. And you can see that uh, uh, very well visualize the superior laryngeal nerve. And you can, with the implant technique, you can block this nerve. You can see that uh, uh, with the, uh, this is the probe here. And we are blocking this uh, uh, superior laryngeal nerve. And we can also uh, do trans uh, laryngeal injection. Uh, this is the cricothyroid membrane. And this is the needle in the implant technique. Now we can see that uh, if the vocal cord movement are uh, bilateral equal, that uh, there is no uh, recurrent uh, laryngeal nerve palsy. This recurrent laryngeal nerve palsy, you must have seen that uh, uh, this is a common occurrence after this neck surgery or thyroid surgery. So if uh, the if, if there is no movement of the vocal side on one one side, as you can see here, that there, there is a unilateral vocal cord pulse. So uh, sometimes uh, we generally see in the ICU setup that uh, after we want to uh, anticipate that is uh, before extubating the uh, patient, whether there is a successful extubation or not. You must have seen many times that after extubate, extubation in the ICU, patient require reintubation. So we, there are several methods uh, by which we are an anticipating for uh, this uh, successful winning in the ICU. But all the methods are not uh, foolproof or accurate. So we have to keep exploring the the the, the, uh, the, uh, the method. Ultrasound also very useful uh, role here. And diaphragm ultrasound is uh, getting day-by-day uh, day popular as an emerging uh, point-of-care ultrasound tool for, for pred prediction of the successful winning and extubation. So you know that uh, uh, you, uh, the diaphragm is the main, the principal and the fundamental muscle of the respiration. So uh, in the ICU setup, there is a study uh, that it, it, most of the extubation are uh, simple, but in the 20 to 25% of cases, we face a difficult uh, winning. And uh, it has been seen that around 40% of the time, in the ICU, is, uh, on, uh, it's uh, engaged in the weaning process. And so we've, there are two important uh, diaphragm uh, parameters. One is diaphragm excursion, how much diaphragm is moving. And second one is how much diaphragm, uh, what is the thickness of the diaphragm. So we, we, these two important parameters are there. One is diaphragm uh, Excursion, how much diaphragm is moving? Diaphragm. So there are several studies for that, for uh, prediction of successful winning and extubation. One is, uh, so uh, if you combine all those findings, if the diaphragm movement, that is diaphragm excursion is more than one, 11 to 14 millimeter, that is a sign of successful winning and extubation. That is one thing. And, and more important uh, parameter is diaphragm thickness fraction. We will see how it is done. So just uh, if the value is more than 30%, that is also an indirect indication that our winning will be successful. First, uh, first we are going to assess the diaphragm excursion. For this, the, uh, we, we have to use this curvilinear proof. We are, uh, we are in the abdomen. And we want to see the diaphragm, so we are using this curvilinear probe. So patient uh, is uh, either supine or recumbent position, and we uh, take a linear probe and put it on a mid clavicular line, just below the subcostal margin. 
Okay, then you will see this diaphragm moment. So this is a uh, diaphragm moment. The, uh, we have already seen in the uh, lung ultrasound uh, the how the diaphragm uh, looks like. So below the diaphragm, there's a liver uh, in the right side and spring on the left side. And above the diaphragm, there's a lung. So this this is the diaphragm very easy to rock, recognize. This is a bright hyperechoic appearance. So after recognition, put an air mode here. And this is the air mode picture. So, you know, this diaphragm move downward, X side during inspiration so during inspiration the diaphragm move closer to to the probe okay so in the ultrasound picture it will be there will be up, upward movement in the ultra air mode tracing okay so diaphragm is moving toward the leg but in the ultrasound picture it, it is moving toward the upward direction during inspiration and the movement in the expiration is just opposite so from the baseline this is the ex expiratory position and this is the inspiratory and expiratory position so this is the vertical length from uh, from the baseline that is the diaphragm excursion you have you can see that uh, i have measured diaphragm excursion in a normal patient this is 1.4 centimeter that is 14 uh, millimeter so if the, 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 the general, the, there is general concept uh, that if it is more than 10 millimeter, then you can predict successful extubation. That is the diaphragm excursion. And the second more important parameter is diaphragm. The, we have a video for diaphragm excursion. This is to show diaphragm excursion in a subcoastal view. For this, patient should be in supine position. Take a curvilinear probe and place it at a mid-clavicular line in a longitudinal plane. First of all, we have to see the diaphragm in a 2D mode. After that, we have to put it in a M mode to see the movement of the diaphragm with inspiration and expiration as it is showing in the ultrasound screen. Now the second and more important parameter is diaphragm thickness fraction. So for this, we, we will use this linear probe. Okay, and uh, this is the intercostal view. We are keeping this linear probe over the uh, anterior or mid axillary line in a cephalocardial direction. And this is the zone of apposition. So it is important to know the zone of apposition. Zone of apposition is the junction where the diaphragm meets the rib cage. You have to keep your linear pro over this zone of apposition area between the tenth and between the eight to ten intercostal spaces, and you will obtain this uh, uh, diaphragm uh, structure. So diaphragm is the three-layered structure, and the, uh, this is first layer that is the uh, hyperechoic pleura. And this is the third uh, layer that is hyperechoic peritoneum. And the diaphragm is a muscular that is hypoechoic that is sandwiched between two hyperechoic structure. So this is the appearance of the diaphragm. And, uh, you know, uh, wh then what is the, this is the thickness, okay, from the inner border of this uh, first layer to the inner border of this third layer. So this is the diaphragm thickness. So this uh, thickness is, uh, this is the inspiratory, uh, expiratory thickness, and this is the inspiratory thickness. You know, this whenever diaphragm contracts during the inspiration, the thickness will naturally increase. It. So if the thickness, uh, this is the inspiratory thickness, and this is the expiratory. So this is the maximum thickness during inspiration minus minimum thickness during expiration divided by minimum thickness into 100 that is the thickness fraction okay if the thickness fraction is more than uh, uh, 30 percent there is a very important study by this dnno at all published in uh, the thorax journal 2014 that if the thickness fraction is more than 30 percent then the sensitivity for successful extubation is about 88%. Now, we are moving towards the gastric ultrasound. So many times, 
you have seen that uh, we uh, we generally uh, keep the npo status for 6 to 8 hours for routine surgeries but we uh, encounter uh, a problem during emergency that npo status is not known okay the history is unreliable or the patient is obtained uh, you cannot take a proper history okay in that condition uh, 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 there is a dilemma about the npo status and moreover you, there is a, if there is an emergency condition so you have to go for the uh, this intubation and uh, anesthesia procedure so ultrasound is very very important and very very important emerging uh, point of care ultrasound tool for assessing the risk of aspiration in such patient so uh, what is the mode here so you have to keep the uh, curvilinear probe in the subgeoid area and uh, the best position is right lateral decubitus position but uh, in the second best position is semi recumbent position or third is supine position okay in the right lateral decubitus position the stomach content are uh, uh, moving towards the anterior part because of gravity one thing i want to tell here that we are seeing only the anterior part of the stomach because that is accessible uh, easily with the help of ultrasound because of the window of the uh, this liver so because of the window we can assess the anterior part of the stomach the uh, the, the fundus part and the body part is difficult to assess with the uh, ultrasound so this is the anterior part and then that, that is a very beautiful uh, beautifully it can be seen with the help, help of ultrasound if the uh, so we are just interested to know whether the uh, there is a empty stomach or full stomach okay so full stomach if there is a full stomach then there is a risk of aspiration we ju just wanted to know that so uh, what is the definition of the full stomach if the full stomach that means if there is a content is solid or um, or if the fluid content is more than 1.5 ml per kg okay in the empty stomach there is a low risk of aspiration okay and uh, sometimes there is a vessel secretion also there so uh, if uh, the because of vessel secretion you may find some amount of liquid that is one less than 1.5 ml per kg so, so uh, the the method is you have to Uh, take a curvilinear probe and uh, in the subjoint area in the longitudinal or sagittal uh, section and you will obtain this picture this is the superficial this is the deep part and this is the cephalic part and this is the uh, this is the caudal part because we we are in a longitudinal uh, direction so this is the liver okay and just below this uh, anterior part of this liver you can find this antrum antrum part of the stomach and just behind the antrum you may find pancreas and this aorta okay and superior mesenteric artery so this antrum part is very very important this is our structure of interest now see uh, this is the same picture uh, uh, i have seen that i have keep this uh, probe in the sagittal section and obtain this picture so first of all uh, we are interested to know how this empty stomach look like so this is the picture of the uh, empty stomach that that is beautifully sent by the pellas et al published in canadian journal of anesthesia you know this this is the anterior part okay in the empty stomach this is rounded structure a small and flat there is nothing inside and the appearance is the bull's eye appearance or target pattern appearance now come to the fluid, uh, liquid content suppose patient has taken some liquid so you, you know this anterior part is dilated or because of liquid this is hypoechoic or anechoic in appearance this is round and distended so if the content is liquid or clear fluid the, you will get this picture now after some time this uh, air is mixed up with the, this liquid and Uh, you will get this starry night pattern this is a starry night pattern when the liquid is mixed up with the air uh, bubbles and this they, they, this are the punctate echoes uh, the third category is the solid food suppose patient have recently taken a solid food so while chewing process the air is mixed up with the uh, solid content and 
when it goes inside the stomach this is the anterior part of the anterior layer of the antrum antrum part and this appears as a hypo because of air bubble is mixed up so air because of air it gives a hyperechoic appearance and this classic appearance is called frosted glass pattern appearance or because of presence of air and nothing is seen beyond that appearance because all the things are obscured the posterior part and after some times when and then when the, the stomach juices starts digesting this solid part there you will find this mixed ecogenicity so in the late phase uh, of the solid content you, you will find this mixed ecogenicity so we have seen this empty stomach liquid content and the solid content now that is fine how to estimate the volume suppose okay the, the, uh, the, there is a liquid content but how to estimate the volume so first of all you have to calculate the uh, enteral cross sectional area and the there are several models there are some uh, several formulas for cal calculating this uh, gastric volume the one uh, formula by pelos i told i suggested this formula this is uh, 27.0 into 14.6 into this cross sectional area minus 1.28 so what is the to make the things very simple uh, if the content is empty there is a low risk proceed as normal if the content is solid then we take it as a high risk for aspiration then you have to take precaution like rapid sequence intubation so confusion arises when the content is uh, a liquid content so if the volume is less than 1.5 ml per kg take it as a low risk of aspiration if the volume is more than 1.5 ml per kg then you have to take it as a high risk of aspiration and if the high risk of aspiration you have to go you have to modify your anesthesia technique like you have to go for this rapid sequence intubation so uh, th uh, this uh, was all about airway ultrasound then we have seen this uh, diaphragm ultrasound then and, and the lastly we have seen the gastric ultrasound so to conclude our uh, our session today so first of all we have discussed the how the sono anatomy how this uh, various structure look like in the ultrasound then difficult laryngoscopy we have estimated we have seen that uh, uh, there are uh, soft tissue thickness measurement at a various level like at the hyoid bone at the this uh, vocal cord or this epiglottis level we can see that if the uh, thickness is higher then indicate uh, about a difficult uh, laryngoscopy then the uh, sometimes we have to predict the what what will the appropriate endotracheal tube size or tracheostomy tube size or even the double lumen tube size ultrasound is a very important uh, role here just measuring this transverse diameter at the trachea we can estimate the sizes of the uh, this ATT or uh even the double lumen tube side and sometimes there is a confusion that about the uh, about the positioning of the endotracheal tube uh, whether uh, whether it is inside the trachea whether it is inside the esophagus or right sided bronchial especially in pediatric age uh, group especially the difficult uh, situation especially when the capnography is not available in such a situation ultrasound is very very useful you just have to keep your probe over the uh, this translator position and you you can confirm within second even without ventilation whether the might tube be inside the trachea or esophagus and sometimes you have to do this emergency cricothyroidotomy especially in the can't intubate can't uh, ventilate situation it's i'm always stressing that if you are anticipating the difficulty airway it's better to mark this cricothyroid membrane with the help of ultrasound before proceeding before making the patient sedated, sedated. and uh, especially in the icu setup you have to uh, do many times you have to do percutaneous uh, uh, dilatation tracheostomy ultrasound very useful to uh, make uh, make the ideal intercostal spaces and uh, to scan the area is there any blood vessel or not to avoid any um, uh, incision over that blood vessels and uh, diaphragm ultrasound emerging very fascinating tool for estimating the successful uh, weaning uh, of the icu patient or extubation patient you have there are two important parameter diaphragm thickness and diaphragm thickness fraction and lastly the gastric ultrasound we can estimate the risk of aspiration 
by by seeing the what is the nature and the, what is the amount of the stomach content when you are uh, not sure about the npo status thank you so I, thank, uh, you. thank you dr neeraj for this uh, wonderful presentation and uh, i really appreciate your efforts to make those uh, beautiful videos uh, which are simple and uh, uh, which contained uh, very good information and uh, easy for any viewers to grasp the subject and uh, dr prasanna your comments on the today's session yeah thank you dr neeraj that's uh, though I this event uh, appears to be very difficult when we see those some videos when we are not practicing but uh, what is said is out of all the ultrasound the airway ultrasound is supposed to be the easiest one to mm -hmm. learn uh, what is recommended is 8 hours of training and you are certified to use the airway ultrasound particularly yes. for this section and the advantage as you described very well that for the confirmation of endotracheal intubation what even the ACLS guidelines now recommend for diagnostic users for therapeutic users for for cutaneous cricotherapy it has wide applications and Every day it is being used uh, uh, very often now in the operation theater as well as in the intensive care unit. To add to that, you have covered even the diaphragm movements and assessment of diaphragm function, which is very vital, particularly uh, when we encounter prolonged uh, ventilation patients in neuro ICUs and we are not sure. And then post extubation strider, what you stressed upon, which also we commonly see in neuro ICUs. All those things were very interesting and are very nicely made videos. Manish, uh, you wanted to ask something to Neeraj. Yes, I want to ask uh, a couple of questions and I, I yeah. also want to ask the questions that have been put by uh, our audience. Okay. So yes. that first I will go uh, through the questions that have been put by the audience. The first question is that is it possible to confirm rise to uh, positioning with the help of ultrasound? Absolutely, absolutely. I uh, uh, see the... Uh, you have to focus on esophagus. So if the esophagus, if suppose you are putting an endotracheal tube uh, in the esophagus, so esophagus will be dilated and you will get a double track sign um, uh, inside the esophagus. The Ryle's tube also gives the same appearance. The dilatation will be uh, in the proportional to the Ryle's tube. So uh, if the esophagus is dilated and giving the double track sign, uh in inside the esophagus and uh, moreover that with the while uh, that, that is one method and the second method uh, do the, this enteral scanning sometimes you will find this uh, your rise tube uh, as a uh, double hyperechoic sign in the enteral part of ultrasound so there are several techniques but uh, uh, it is very easy to diagnose you just have to keep your probe here and see the esophagus Is esophagus you dilated and the double track sign your, uh, they no need to ventilate and uh, take a stethoscope to see the uh, to auscultate this gastric artery. No need. Okay. The second question is how uh, we can see the tracheomalacia, like the patients who are having large thyroid swellings and other issues. Is it possible to see uh, to see the tracheomalacia? And another question that is from me is that like uh, while decannulating the tracheostomy tube, is it possible to visualize the uh, tracheal part above the tracheostomy tube so that to see whether there is any tracheal narrowing or uh, any stitcher over there to just the successful uh, decannulation. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, regarding this decannulation, you can see this whole, uh, this, uh, you, you, uh, you suppose this is the, uh, this is the opening of the tracheostomy tube. So you just have to scan this area and measurement measure this uh, uh, this uh, tracheal diameter. You can very well see is there any pathology, is there any stenosis or not. You can also uh, suppose uh, you want to see the above that opening. So you can also see uh, the. You just have to keep this uh, linear probe over the thyroid cartilage. You can see this uh, uh, vocal. Uh, cord uh, movement also we can see the diameter uh, you can see measure diameter at various level and you can uh, diagnose the tracheal stenosis uh, of course uh, uh, regarding tracheomalacia if there is a, uh, if, the, if there is a contour of the trachea is normal okay if there is a, uh, this uh, continuity of this uh, uh, this cartilages are normal then uh, most probably the tracheomalacia is uh, ruled out 
also okay, hope, uh, another question yeah. okay okay one more Please. minute also what i feel no, the advantage of ultrasound see nowadays you take for any malignancy or any even a thyroid or any other disorder the ct scan has become a standard of care they do a ct and uh, we assess the tracheal diameter and all using the ct scan but when you look at the ultrasound ultrasound gives a discrete advantage as compared to the ct scan so ct scan is a single point of test that it is a static test but when you use ultrasound actually you see the dynamics whether the airway diameter is reducing whether it is increasing or any specific maneuver like if you lift the thyroid or if you move the thyroid towards one direction whether the airway diameter increases that can be seen using the ultrasound which will help like for example you are intubating a case and now you know that if you move the thyroid like this or if you lift the diameter increases maybe your visibility or and uh, uh, success of intubation also increases that is the one of the most important advantages of the ultrasound that's why more and more papers are coming for the dynamic assessment of the airway during the ultrasound now Nearest, do you have anything to say on this yes yes uh, uh, regarding uh, one question uh, one person asked that uh, thyroid enlargement uh, i have just described during uh, this transverse view of the supra sternal notch level we can see that right lobe then stomach then the left lobe if the size is uh, increased then uh, you can uh, very well uh, see uh, those uh, enlargement of the thyroid gland Okay, then yes, there is, can, if we can see uh, endotracheal tube cuff rupture with the help of ultrasound or is there any problem with flexometrical, uh, flexometallic endotracheal tube in situ with ultrasound? So, uh, the, the first question is, you, you want to see the cuff rupture. So, there is one method that uh, you can uh, inflate that uh, cuff with the saline. Okay, saline ha has been used by several authors. So, if the saline uh, with the uh, with the saline in the cup, right. the visual visual impression of the ultrasound is very good. Visual uh, image in, uh, increases. So, with the if the contour of the cup while you are inflating the cup with the saline is normal, then there is no cuff rupture. But if the by inflating the cup with the saline, uh, the, uh, you are not getting the normal appearance. Then you can say there is a cuff rupture. And flexometallic, of course, it is important to know that whether my uh, tube is inside the trachea or esophagus. That is more important. And if your tube is inside the esophagus, the esophagus will be dilated and it, there is a double track sign inside the esophagus. That is most important. Okay, thank you so much. You uh, answered the queries of the audiences very much, very well. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so one yeah. Also, there was a paper from, I think, Tata, Tata Memorial Hospital for confirmation of DLT position also using the ultrasound. Okay, so yeah, you, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah I, I just wanted to stress upon that. I forgot uh, at that time. See, the, in the one lung ventilation, we want to we want to know what is the size of GLT. Uh, See, the, uh, one lung ventilation uh, is very <laughs> sometimes very difficult to uh, perform. So, uh, for, the first challenge is what will be the size of the uh, double limit tube. The size we have four options: 35, 37, 39, and 41. So, by measuring this uh, this tracheal diameter, suppose the diameter is 13 millimeter then the size uh, uh, will be 35 if the size is uh, 14 millimeter the size will be 37 of the dlt suppose the tracheal diameter is 15 millimeter then the size will be 39 french of the dlt if the size is 18 millimeter then the size of the dlt will be 41 uh, french that is one very useful and the uh, one of the major challenges while you are uh, doing one lung ventilation and putting dlt that you have to confirm by Lung, left lung is ventilating and right lung is not ventilating. And suppose you, you have uh, confirmed with the auscultatory finding or with the fiber optic. And whenever you make the, the patient in a one side position, then again the, the difficulty arises. So sometimes fiber optic is also not available. Moreover, you have to need a, need a, this uh, pediatric size fiber optic in the uh, one lung ventilation when you want to uh, confirm. So you just suppose you, uh, you want to collapse this right lung, you want to ventilate this left lungs. 
take a scenario. Then simil, the sliding sign will be absent at the right side and the sliding sign will be present on the left side. Then your tube position is perfect. Similarly, if the diaphragm right side is not moving and if the diaphragm the left side is moving, then your side, uh, your, uh, your the position of the DLT is perfect. That is a very useful application of the ultrasound. Yeah. So uh, similar is the assessment of the vocal cord function as you covered yeah. that uh, it has been found with many this uh, post thyroid patient. Uh, the standard practice was to do a FOB and uh, see the vocal cord movements uh, following the surgery. So it has been shown with the ultrasound that uh, it reduces the number of uh, FOB requirements following the surgery and uh, vocal cord movements has been successfully used. Similarly, we can extrapolate this to our ACDF surgeries also, where we expect a recurrent laryngeal nerve, uh, pressure on the recurrent laryngeal nerve and then the any injury, we can do even following the uh, following the ACDF surgeries also, the vocal cord movements. Are you doing it routinely in your institute following the ACDF, Neeraj? Uh, uh, miss, you, you want to know that uh, whether we are doing fiber optic or ultrasound? On ultrasound for ACDF surgeries, as no. there is no indication that we are, right, right. Uh, we are not uh, doing in a routine practice, but definitely after this uh, this pandemic uh, is over, I would like to do. Yeah, I would request all the audience to do that. Yeah, when the pandemic is think, over, the more we do, the more we get the experience of it, and then the more we'll be able to identify even the abnormalities. Many times we do routinely for something else and you find the vocal cord polyp is there and all those things and even the malignancies, restriction of cord movement, everything we can appreciate. It is all the more we do it, uh, the more we can analyze. And of course, there are other diagnostic uh, features what you describe thoroughly that which can predict a difficult intubation using the ultrasound. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for this uh, lucid presentation and bring one last, uh, last. Yeah, uh, one, one important uh, thing I was just yeah. showing, yes. right now yeah. I am working in the COVID ICU. Okay, okay, uh, so you know, uh, inside the ICU, you have to wear this PPT, then goggles, and all the things are there. In that ISO, the uh, the uh, the use of ultrasound is very um, very uh, very very useful. Okay, in that setup, suppose uh, suppose you have intubated the patient, how you auscultate the patient with the help of this uh, this your uh, stethoscope? You, you okay. cannot apply this stethoscope. Then I am routinely using this ultra uh, ultrasound probe. Just keep my probe over the uh, this uh, this transtracheal or lung sliding and diaphragm that is i, I personally uh, feel that the, uh, in such uh, covid scenario the um, use of a stethoscope can be replaced by this ultrasound uh, yes, probe. yes true. Uh, it has been said that you use stethoscope only when it is going to change your line of management so and it is uh, highly difficult to even auscultate using a pp and all those stuff yes, and yes. the risk of contamination so ultrasound no doubt it has emerged as a such a valuable tool not only for the assessment of the lungs and pneumonic part and all those things in the endotracheal in confirmation of endotracheal intubation yes it's a very vital tool in that you can detect it early and somebody can keep monitoring while you are intubating that's a very good tool thank you thank you Neeraj, for bringing right. that yeah, have we finished with our focus topics or do we have one more class? I think we promised that we will do one class on cannulation and all those stuff. Is it there? Yeah, or? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, yeah I, we, will, we will have one class on uh, yeah, procedure, procedure related classes uh, uh, and also yeah. some, some interesting uh, videos, interesting uh, things we can call out from our event members if they have some videos interesting videos to share we can discuss yeah yeah, yes, yes. yeah. from, not from not your personal connections yes yeah yes yeah i think we will do that uh, neeraj thank you yeah, thank you very much thank you dr neeraj for this uh, wonderful class and uh, as usual it was uh, very vivid and very lucid so uh, hopefully we'll join in uh, one more session to learn about the procedures uh, ultrasound guided routine procedures, the cannulations and other things in our day-to-day -day practice. Thank you so much.
and we'll meet you in the next class thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you on the audience who are actually participating